<laughs> Sorry for this little delay. Um, so thank you for being so many of you. Um, as I was preparing um, uh, this speech, I was looking for something um, that might be common to all the different things I'm going to show you, um, so as to have a backbone to my speech and not simply show you a list of things, of works. And um, as I was thinking, I suddenly remembered a film I saw when I was, was a teenager, and, uh, which was called um, Alexandre le Bienheureux, uh, which means uh, happy, blissful Alexander. It, it tells the story of a man who leads a very um, agreeable and lazy life. Uh, he spends his life in bed and doesn't have to get up because um, he has all these uh, handles, um, this elaborate system of handles and strings, uh, which allows him to have everything he needs um, within reach, his food, his wine, his musical instruments, etc. Uh, now, Alexandre has built this uh, complex system himself, so that paradoxically, in order to lead uh, his lazy life, he had to work very hard uh, to make that lazy life possible. Um, I personally feel very close to Alexandre. I think that what he does is close to how artists work. Indeed, an artist often spends much time um, bringing together the conditions which will allow him to create as freely as possible, uh, which reminds me of those words by Brancusi, uh, who said, uh, doing, be beautiful, uh, doing beautiful things is not that difficult. Uh, what is difficult um, is putting oneself in the condition for doing beautiful things. Um, for my part, I generally spend much time um, inventing systems uh, which will make me, sorry, uh, which will make my work easier, which is comparable to the jazz musician who uses a grid, um, uh, as they call it, on which to improvise, or comparable to the traveler um, who will feel freer to travel uh, out of the tracks if he has a map to make him feel safe. Uh, so this is the axis I've chosen to speak about my work, laziness, and uh, how to make that laziness possible. Um, I've also chosen to show you a rather wide range of works, and not only my work as a graphic designer. Uh, indeed, I'm also a painter and author of children's books, uh, a stage and costume designer, and uh, I would like to try and show you how um, uh, these different fee fields um, feed each other and how they, in turn, feed my work as a graphic designer, or, or, uh, or so I hope. Um, therefore, I show you a selection of my works in the following order. I begin with stage design, then interactive installations, then books, graphic design, and then painting and drawing. And I'll start right now with a, a recent work, uh, followed by some others in the field of stage design. Yes, so this, I think, is a good example of a great deal of effort invested in the creation of a system um, which allowed me to produce uh, new forms or other forms without any additional effort. Um, it's a stage design for a ballet by Benjamin Millepied on music by Philip Glass, uh, which was given in the Opéra Garnier in Paris. I chose to make a very simple set and to project an animated film uh, on the backdrop, an animated film which moved very, very slowly and which is made from two grids, a, a vertical grid and a horizontal grid, um, which were sliding very slowly on top of each other. Um, so that forms appeared out of the interaction between the two moving layers. So it was a sort of self-generating system of forms, uh, and so to speak, a lazy set design. And uh, here is a screenshot um, of the film in the making. Here it is, yeah, okay. It, which is a very simple uh, contraption made with uh, uh, Flash software, uh, software. Sorry. In this other example of a stage design, uh, my set was directly inspired by a constraint given by the theatre. The set had to be uh, very easy to carry around on tours abroad, um, so I designed this collection of collapsible, collapsible and telescopic boxes, and all of them, in the end, uh, can be stored in the biggest box, which serves as a container for the whole set. 
Um, so I could say that here it was a technical constraint which gave me direct inspiration for my forms. And as for this one, uh, it's a ballet called Sylphide, which we gave in Geneva. Um, I simply took my inspiration from the uh, original set for the piece, which was a uh, um, stage set by Leon Baxt, made in the context of the Ballet Russe, uh, which I turned, as it were, upside down, because where Baxt made a very colorful landscape, uh, I made it black and white, and where Baxt uh, gave the ballerinas white costumes, I gave them colorful costumes. And for this last example of lazy and very lazy set design, where I tried to make as much as possible with uh, as little as possible, um, uh, it was a set for Tchaikovsky's The Nutcracker. Uh, this is Act One, and this is Act Two, so that I simply have two sets from only one which I ro rotate upside down. Now, uh, the works I create for the stage uh, often inspire me for what I do with installations and uh, the other way around. As for this one, for example, I did a few months ago in the Centre Pompidou, which I called Playground, and which is a bit like a stage set visitors may uh, arrange as they wish. Indeed, the elements uh, may be moved around because they are all mounted on wheels. And here are two variations on the same idea. It's a sort of labyrinth mounted on wheels. And now a village of container-like boxes, um, the walls of which are made of sliding doors, uh, so that it's the public um, who creates the final aspect of the structure. So as you can see, those installations are interactive or participatory, somehow the laziest possible kind of work, because it's the audience who works and not me. Or, to be more precise, I work beforehand, a little bit like Alexandre did, uh, to create the elements with which the public is invited to play. For example, in, in this installation, which I call the Jeu de Construction, which you mentioned in the introduction, which means the building kit or a, a set of building blocks, um, the elements I prepared are very basic. They are only parallel pipettes made of wood, plastic and foam. And there were thousands and thousands of them uh, displayed on huge tables for the public to play with. Um, I showed this in Centre Pompidou some ten years ago. Now, the important detail of this is that I made the blocks myself and I patiently sawed every uh, block and I took great care never to cut uh, exactly right angles, uh, but everything was a little bit wobbly, so that people couldn't easily build anything uh, they wanted with these blocks, since they had to respect the block's own logic. Um, it wasn't possible, for instance, to build a chalet or a skyscraper you would have uh, preconceived with a sketch. No, you had to build really from the possibilities offered by the blocks. Um, now, this notion um, of creating from the medium's own logic and the medium's own specificity is something very important, I think, in artistic creation. And my installation wanted to illustrate uh, this important notion in a, in a playful way. Now, a variation on the same idea which I did in the 104, which is a, a huge exhibition space in Paris, uh, where people were uh, invited to build miniature installations with uh, various materials uh, inside a model of the 104 itself. Now I'd like, you, I'd like to show you this work, um, which is an installation I made for the Chaumont Festival a few years ago. Um, as you see, the exhibition was like a huge playground, half billiard, half mini golf, um, where people were invited to aim at the holes with balls. Um, but this was extremely difficult because of the hills and valleys of the installation. Now, as you know, the Chaumont Festival is a festival of graphic design. Um, now, I, I chose to show this installation as a sort of uh, gentle provocation. Indeed, it had no direct link with graphic design, except maybe um, in a very discreet manner because of the uh, cartographic things painted, painted on the surface. 
And my idea with this installation was uh, that I wanted to hint at the notion of transdisciplinarity by deliberately showing something that was not graphic design within the context of a festival of graphic design. The message was simply that it's uh, sometimes risky uh, to be uh, too narrowly uh, specialized. And now I'll finish this paragraph on interactive installations with two more examples. This one, which is a network of slides uh, on which little cars were moving. Each card had a word on it, um, so that the chance meeting of the cars uh, created uh, amusing and involuntary sentences. Uh, it's a principle I also used in this installation, um, which was a modular furniture I made for a library uh, where each cube can be mu moved and uh, the words on each side of each cube um, form random and silly sentences. Ah, I have some kind of technical problem here, which I don't know how I can solve. I'm going to wait for some extraordinary help. <laughs> help, please. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll describe the following images, but... Uh, <laughs> an ID, someone? No? I'll continue somehow and just imagine what I'm going to describe. Uh, so I was talking about a play with words with these cubes in the library, and um, this gives me a perfect transition. Yes, okay, thank you. Great. Uh, transition with what follows. Um, which is a short uh, chapter about books, where I often play with words in the same way. And I will start with this one. Um, no, it doesn't want to appear. <laughs> okay. Help again. Aha. I really, I, I'll just try to go back. It doesn't answer anywhere anymore, in fact. I feel really alone and helpless. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'll continue. Oh, great. That's my... Thank you very much. <laughs> so, um, I start with this example uh, in uh, this short chapter about books. Uh, this book was printed in lithography in 110 copies, and uh, each book has been bound differently and randomly. Uh, the pages uh, appear in different orders in each copy, except for the first page, which is always the same, the first page of text, and the last page, which is always the same image. And here you see the first text page with three different images. Uh, now, the text is written in such a way that uh, whatever the order of the pages, uh, the story can always be read as a consistent whole. And, of course, it's amusing to observe how uh, any image can go with any text and uh, how their meanings reciprocally influence each other. And uh, since each book was uh, unique, um, I gave a unique title to each of the 110 copies so that I could suddenly and lazily add uh, 110 titles to my own bibliography. This leads me to the following work, which was a very strange experience for me. It's a copy of a daily newspaper from Geneva, and uh, the story is that the director offered me carte blanche, as we say in French. He said, you can do whatever you like. Uh, I think he had in mind I would uh, do a few illustrations or some decorative devices here and there. Um, and I answered, uh, I didn't like color photographs in daily newspapers, and that I wished to replace all the color photographs with blocks of solid color. And of course, I was almost sure they wouldn't accept this uh, mad idea, but uh, to my greatest surprise, uh, they did, and this is the result. Of course, that day, the photographers were quite angry with me because they lost their job. 
But the journalists played the game and uh, they wrote uh, very precise captions under the color blocks. Now, the unexpected aspect of the joke is that it created a real scandal in Geneva. During one week, the readers' letters published in the paper were half of them insulting and the other half uh, enthusiastic. Uh, the paper lost many subscribers, but also gained many others. Uh, the director was fired. So that this was a very, very minimal and lazy creation, but with a maximum effect. <laughs> Now, what follows may be useful, I hope, uh, because it shows you how to make an illustrated book easily and lazily. Uh, first, you see I decided for an alphabet, so to speak, a figurative alphabet. As you see, each letter is um, represented by an object, uh, the first letter of which is precisely the necessary letter. I mean, A is an airplane, uh, C is a castle, etc., R is a rain, and so on. And then you just have to build your images from the alphabet. And of course, you, you take great care to put little numbers on each of the elements of the image so that you can read it. Uh, this one, for instance, I can help you is um, the number one is uh, I for the igloo, uh, number two is L for lightning, three is O for oak tree, uh, four is V, volcano, etc. And so you can read this uh, like I love you, and it's a very long story. Of course, it's a long way to read. But it's a very easy way, very, very easy way to illustrate your text. And by the way, actually, there is no text because the text is the image and vice versa. I must say that uh, playing with alphabets is, of course, always fun and can be very inspiring. Um, many, many years ago, I was doing this kind of work. At that time, as I was uh, very much inspired by Jean, Jean or Hans Arp. And um, at one point, in, at, at that time, I got really, really stuck. I, I, I thought this looked elegant, but it was not enough, and I, I was uh, blocked. So I, I had to try something else, and I decided to use my shapes as an alphabet. And I started making alphabetical compositions, which spelled out words. And this constraint, or rule of the game, um, really saved me and inspired me new combinations, unblocked me, and uh, my work uh, could go on. Now, from this experience, I made a book for children, uh, which I called Animo, Animals, using my own uh, Hans Arp uh, alphabet, in which uh, each double spread spells out the name of, the animal, of an animal. I wish to make an abstract-looking book, but of course the images are not abstract because they spell out animals' names. Actually, I made many other books for children, and I would now like to comment, comment briefly on this one, uh, which was a commissioned book. Indeed, um, uh, a town near Paris used to give each year to each newborn child a, a book like a welcome gift, uh, which was uh, sent by mail to the families. Um, so I had to design a book for uh, non or not yet readers. Uh, my idea is very simple. Um, the book has no cover. Each page can be used as a cover, and each page bears a caption, the same caption, uh, which can therefore be considered as the title of the book. And the caption uh, reads, um, so sorry, here it's the Italian version, but in French the, 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 the title or the caption says, cependant, um, uh, which in French means, uh, however, but also meanwhile. And uh, the images show a collection of things happening around the world at the sa very same instant. And uh, this is why the subtitle of the book is uh, the shortest book in the world, because it takes place in one fraction of a second. Um, now, what I wanted to say about this book is that when I was working on it, um, I spent much, much time preparing my tools, the dots, the grid, etc. Uh, but when the toolbox was ready, uh, creating one image after another uh, seemed to me extraordinarily easily and amusing. Um, the pleasure I felt uh, while making these images 
remind, uh, reminded me of uh, something I experimented as a child, and uh, which maybe some of you have also experimented as well. Um, the story is my, my, my grandfather had a typewriter and uh, he, he allowed me to play with it. And I remember I spent hours and hours uh, writing texts on it because I enjoyed the machine so much. And I think I wouldn't have written so much um, without that machine. And this is an important thing uh, to, to, to stress, I think, uh, the necessity to choose tools one really enjoys uh, using and the nature of which uh, can induce and inspire new forms. And now I'll finish this chapter about books with three more lazy examples, uh, which I won't speak about at length, but just show them quickly. Uh, this is a reverse coloring book. I mean that the book is already colored and uh, the reader is invited to add the outlines and thus do half of the work. Um, and the reader is also invited to work very hard in this lazy book, um, which is, so to speak, um, a show contained in a book. Um, it contains, the book contains 222 little diagrams uh, of houses to be cut and built, cut out and built. And so that when you bought the book, in fact, you also bought the whole show in the context of which the book was uh, sold. On condition, of course, you had the courage to cut out and build all the little houses. And I'll finish with this last lazy book, which is called The Art of Color, which is simply and lazily a pastiche of Joseph Albers and Johannes Itzen's books but entirely in black and white, as you can see, and with a precise key uh, to the various grids corresponding, corresponding to sign, magenta, black and yellow. My laziness, of course, extends to graphic design, uh, to which I will now devote this new chapter. Um, as a graphic designer, I do mostly uh, posters and mainly for theatres and operas in France. I'd like to show you this series of posters uh, which I made for a theatre in Dijon in France. Now, as you know, usually a theatre um, uh, usually uh, publishes the first poster which announces all the different shows which are going to take place during the season and then one poster after another for each individual show. Now, I thought of an easy and lazy way to do this. Um, as you will see now, each poster can be attached to the previous one. Like this. But actually, this is how I worked. I, in fact, I started by making the general poster for the season, which I simply had to cut into 30 pieces to have the 30 individual uh, posters. And since it was such an easy and pleasant method to create my posters, I used the method the following year. And here again, of course, they, attach, they can be attached to each other. And of course, I won't surprise you if I, if I tell you the season posters of the two successive years uh, could be assembled together. But then, unfortunately, the director of the theatre got tired of my system and we changed the method uh, next year. Here are a few more examples of my posters, which I, I, I won't comment upon, just uh, show them while I take a little bit of water. Now, after this quick intermission uh, without words <laughs> and images alone, I will finish my speech with what is a daily practice for me uh, and the practice in which all the rest I do, I feel, finds its origin. Every day I draw and paint um, at least two hours making uh, visual studies of what I see. There are sometimes portraits, but uh, most often uh, landscapes, at least when I am staying in the countryside. And, um, I feel that of all the constraints I'm, I've been experimenting with, 
Uh, this one, the, the mere uh, constraint to represent what I see before my eyes, um, is the most fertile and most inspiring one. I honestly feel that uh, it is in this daily practice uh, that I find inspiration for all the rest, new shapes, new color combinations, etc. And finally, the daily continuity of this uh, gives me probably a stability uh, which I feel is necessary in contrast to the variety of things I experiment with. What I showed you um, uh, may indeed seem very varied and made up of different parts, um, a little bit like chapche, this Korean dish made of different ingredients, and which I show you because I'm getting a little hungry, and probably you too. Um, I must say I've never really been worried by uh, stylistic consistency. On the contrary, I, I'd rather suffer from stylistic claustrophobia. Um, I consider all my activities uh, rather as a game, albeit a very serious one. And by the way, it's amusing to observe that in many langu languages, um, uh, the word play, the, for, uh, concerning game, the word play um, is used uh, in relation to artistic activities, in English, of course, in French also. Actors play, musicians play. And also in French, the word play, the, which is said je, the word play, has the meaning of gambling, of betting. Uh, this is also interesting, I think, concerning artistic activities, since you never really know uh, where you are going. It's always a little bit like making a bet. And uh, this is, of course, what makes it all so exciting. A little bit like Christopher uh, Columbus, who uh, carefully planned his trip, and uh, instead of reaching the land uh, he intended to reach, uh, actually discovered a whole new continent. And now, to conclude my speech on laziness, I will uh, make a very lazy conclusion, as I will stop speaking now and simply show you a one-minute film I just made, one of a series for the Centre Pompidou in Paris, and the title of which reads A History of Art. Thank you very much.